thank you for joining us in this, another one of the series called A Matter of Faith. But I, I'd like to go to the fact of the faith again, all embracing, you, you cannot be halfway, you, uh, that it envelops you. The, I was just wondering uh, whether it's possible to have, um, I suppose it's possible to have little faith. The scriptures even mention it. O oh, ye of little faith. Yes. However, it's really, uh, uh, seems to be directed there to people who have switched off, who just reject the sound and the word. Uh, but uh, the world of, of St. Paul's remark that faith comes by hearing rather than by uh, any uh, visual manifestation suggests how total it is. Somebody has, in fact, it was the old philosophers who pointed out that the world of residence, acoustic space, is a complete sphere whose center is everywhere and whose margin is nowhere. And in the world of faith, you have that experience of being always at the center, and the center is everywhere, and the margins are nowhere. This is um, the amazing structure about the resonant world of hearing as compared with the visual world with its sharp boundaries, its rigid points of view, its antagonisms, differences, and uh, contrasts, and so on. Whereas the world of, of the world of faith, with its much greater power to receive and to involve, seems to rule out a lot of these pit, uh, petty differences, petty points of view. I'd like to say <clears throat> that once upon a time, you knocked on the door of the church. You found something in there. You were a man so rich with the uh, blessings of intellect and, uh, and uh, other resources, and yet you came up to the door of the church to knock on it and say, I want to get inside. Would you uh, elaborate on that? It's not a, it's not a, a sort of um, a story that I'm really accustomed to talking about, but uh, in my own case, why, as a student of literature and the arts, I became aware of the enormous role that the church had played in underpinning these great human activities over the centuries. I was aware that the church had always been on the side of art and intellect, and that uh, the effects of the church, therefore, were everywhere for men to see and admire. But the causes remained hidden. And as an approach to the causes, I became curious to know uh, what one had to do. And having, as it were, surveyed the world of conventional, historical, apologetics, argumentation, and so on for many sides, I became aware that if you're really going to test the reality of the church, you had to test it on its own ground. And the church, as a ground demands that uh, we approach it by prayer. And I simply decided to meet that uh, need of prayer as an approach to the church and simply to ask, show me, is it true? Just show me. And the uh, evidence came unexpectedly and from many quarters and uh, unmistakably and I think that um, it might be a rather uh, interesting scientific experiment for any um, non-believer, as they're called, uh, to simply get down on his knees for a few hours every week and demand that he be shown the reality of this unknown thing. And it doesn't depend, uh, they, anybody will soon discover, it does not depend upon concepts theories, ideas. It is a thing with a life that is available to all who want to share in that life, but it must be demanded. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. But you have to knock, and you have to knock pretty hard. So that is a, a beautiful uh, argument in favor of prayer that you've just uh, given us. And l when you uh, enter the church, began to be a participant in its riches and its uh, graces. 
what are the most memorable and most satisfying things that you've got through all these years? Well, I, my, I myself have, cannot think of anything catastrophic or uh, traumatic about my own relation to the church. It has been, to me, a steady source of nutrition, a steady source of strength, a steady and unremitting source of simple, fundamental nourishment. I think of the church as an all-nourishing mother, and you, never, you don't need any one kind of nourishment, you need many kinds. And so my own, as I say, relation to the church has been a very steady matter of constant appeal for daily nourishment. And uh, this is where, to me, the church uh, is uh, the obvious and uh, irreplaceable fact. And uh, I've never had a great deal of concern about the dogmatic problems or about the theological problems. And uh, these seem to me to be taken care of quite naturally by the steady flow of nourishment. So that's a lovely picture of, uh, of uh, the church being a mother. Yes. And I'd say that it'd be easy for me to go from there to uh, the mother of Jesus Christ, our blessed mother, and I'd love your comments on her. Well, I think of her as a very liberated woman indeed. The mother of God was, after all, a fairly liberated person. And uh, I think, therefore, that many of these rather controversial matters tend to fall into quite a different perspective when put against that ground. And uh, that enormous ground, and all enveloping ground, gives these little daily controversies a rather different uh, stance or a different view altogether. Yes. So I think the, uh, I think of Our Lady as a perpetual means of aid in my studies. I, I think of her as our mother of good studies all the time. And she herself, having spent her years in the temple as a young girl studying the scriptures, has always been made uh, the patron of studies, has she not? Yes, Our Lady of the Studies. And this, it seems to me, at a time like this, uh, is a very great role for her to play because the things that we now have to study in the world are rather tremendous and anew. How would you relate to our Blessed Mother as a, a model, as an inspiration? You remember uh, this, the text in which she is spoken of as having played before God in the beginning? That's right, in one of the, um, for the 8th of December Mass, that epistle just r But this, reflects this that. image of her as having played before God in the beginning is, I think, relevant to our, our relation to her today, because she is not only a mother of good studies, but a, mo a mother of all the joy and all the, f all the excitement and, and satisfaction to be found in study and in understanding. Her own relation to these things was joyful, and her, own, uh, her, her whole being is playful and joyful. She is also our, 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 our Lady of Sorrows, Our Lady of Mercy, but in this relationship of studies, there is that of joyful discovery. And uh, we live in a world in which discovery uh, is not only a source of joy, but discovery is now possible on a fantastic new scale. In the electric age, the amount of information available to man about himself and about the rest of mankind and about the world we live in, the amount of information available instantly and totally at all times is beyond anything that previous ages ever knew. And so I think of her as having a specially important role to play in this age of tremendous learning.